7 Facts About Jezebel That Many People Do Not Know Number 1. The Meaning of Her Name Jezebel was the child of the priest king Ethbaal, ruler of the Phoenician cities of Tyre and Sidon. Her name in Phoenician meant primrose, but the exact name in Hebrew, Jezebel, meant garbage, which was how she was known. Number 2. Her husband was also horrific. In the Old Testament, Jezebel was King Ahab's wife. Ahab was the monarch of the kingdom of Israel during that time. Not only did Ahab follow Jeroboam into idolatry, but he also married Jezebel, who was the daughter of the king of the Sidonians. Both of these actions contributed to Ahab's reputation as an extremely wicked king. According to the Book of Kings, Ahab was recognized as the king who was the worst of all the kings. He was able to create a great deal of destruction over his 22 years of rule. He surpassed all his predecessors in wickedness. And as if it were done with an outstanding hostility both to God and Israel, to anger him and ruin them, it is said, he did more intentionally to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger, and consequently to send judgments on his land, than all the kings of Israel that were before him. 1 Kings chapter 16 verses 29 to 33 In the thirty-eighth year of Asa king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel twenty-two years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. This was the man that Jezebel was married to. It was abundantly evident that she utilized Ahab to accomplish her nefarious goals, and he did not require much convincing. This was the first time that a king of Israel had allied himself by marriage with a heathen lady, and the combination was in this case of a peculiarly disastrous kind. Number 3. She Worshipped Baal Jezebel came to the conclusion that she would practice the satanic cult of Baal in place of the worship of the Lord God. 450 prophets ministered under her care to Baal, besides 400 prophets of the groves or Asherah, or Astarte, a Phoenician goddess which ate at her table. 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 19 Now therefore send, and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. Baal was the name of the god who was worshipped throughout Canaan and Phoenicia in ancient times. The practice of Baal worship became widespread in Israel during the reign of Ahab, and the practice of Baal worship also affected Judah. Various parts worship Baal in different methods and Baal proved to be a highly universal god. Various locales highlighted one or another of his attributes and designed special sects of Baalism. Baal is depicted in sculptures wearing a helmet embellished with a bull's horns, a symbol of strength and fertility. He holds a club or mace in one hand, probably representing thunder, and a spear adorned with leaves in the other possibly representing both lightning and vegetation. In Aramean sculptures, Baal is depicted riding a bull, which may be related to Aaron and Jeroboam I's calf images, which were most likely used as pedestals for the invisible Yahweh. Anath, referred to euphemistically as the Virgin Anath, was Baal's spouse and sister, and shared many of his escapades. Baal's priests worshipped their deity with riotous rites that featured ecstatic shouts and self-inflicted harm. 
Number 4. She convinced her husband to worship. After they were married, Jezebel was successful in convincing Ahab to accept Baal. She was a woman who craved more power and sought to silence anybody who tried to challenge her authority. She was not directed by any principles, was not constrained by any fear of either God or man, and was zealous in her commitment to the pagan worship that she practiced. She spared no effort to retain idolatry and all of its grandeur around her. Her actions were, in many ways, extremely detrimental to the kingdoms of both Israel and Judah. Number 5. The Crime That Led to Her Ultimate Downfall Chapter 21 of 1 Kings traces the events leading up to Jezebel and Ahab's death. There aren't many couples in the Bible that are less appealing to look at than King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. At the conclusion of 1 Kings, we are introduced to their obscene distasteful crime. Because they suffered from an almost complete absence of charismatic leadership, they were forced to resort to deceit, selfishness, and cunning in order to achieve their goals. The location is in Jezreel, where Ahab and Jezebel had a palace. Adjoining the palace was a vineyard possessed by Naboth the Jezreelite, and Ahab desired to annex the vineyard so he could plant a vegetable garden there. Naboth refused to sell or exchange his land, since the law of Israel decreed that property should remain in the family to which it was originally assigned. Numbers chapter 36 verse 7 So no inheritance of the Israelites shall be transferred from tribe to tribe, for every one of the Israelites shall hold the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers, tribal ancestors. When Jezebel found her spouse annoyed and grumpy, and learned of Naboth's refusal to sell his vineyard, she assured Ahab that the vineyard would soon be his. 1 Kings chapter 21 verses 8 to 16 So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived with Naboth in his city. Now in the letters she wrote, Proclaim a fast, and seat Naboth at the head of the people, and seat two worthless and unprincipled men opposite him, and have them testify against him, saying, You cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the men of his city, the elders and the nobles who lived there, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, just as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast, and seated Naboth at the head of the people. Two worthless and unprincipled men came in and sat down opposite him, and they testified against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth cursed and renounced God and the king. Then they brought him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned to death. When Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, she said to Ahab, Arise! Take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to sell you, because Naboth is no longer alive but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Jezebel, being the devious person that she was, set up Naboth in such a way that it appeared as though he was being executed for disobeying the law of Jehovah. Jezebel ordered the deaths of Naboth's boys because she knew that following their father's passing, the inheritance would go to them. The wicked queen was as methodical as she was evil in her approach to her evil schemes. Elijah ran into Ahab as he was on his way to seize ownership of the vineyard, and he pronounced judgment against Ahab for murder as well as theft. Elijah said that Ahab would be slain that the body of Jezebel would be devoured by dogs in Jezreel, and that Ahab's descendants would not be given a proper burial. The harshness of Ahab's punishment can be understood by considering the depths to which he sank in his pursuit of idolatry. The Bible states that there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness.
After Ahab learned of his impending destruction, he bowed down before the Lord in repentance. In response to this, the Lord issued a decree that the judgments that were to be passed on Ahab's wife and children would not take place until after Ahab had passed away. If we learn anything from these verses, it is that God is a God of grace and mercy. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11 Even Ahab's superficial repentance brought a respite, but the next chapter proves that his heart was unchanged. Grace was met by pride, so the Lord handed Ahab over to the angel of death, and Jehu was appointed to carry out the bloody decree against the rest of his house according to the prophecy of Elijah. Number 6. She slayed God's prophets. 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 4. For when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave, and provided them with bread and water. 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 13. Has it not been told to my Lord Elijah what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave, and provided them with bread and water. Number 7. She tried her best to slay Elijah. Let me introduce to you the three central characters of this fantastic Bible story. First is Ahab, the king of Israel. Second is Jezebel, the wife of Ahab. The third character is Elijah, one of the great prophets of God. His name means Jehovah is my God. While Jezebel was eliminating the people and places connected to the true God, the Lord placed on the scene a man whose name testified that the Lord Jehovah was his God. James chapter 5 verses 17 and 18 uses Elijah as an example of the power of prayer. James said, He was a man with a nature like ours. That means he was an ordinary man. Elijah had greatness but he also had weakness. But one important fact redeems everything about this man. Elijah was a man of prayer. Elijah went public. He arranged a meeting with King Ahab. Three years had passed since Elijah had declared no rain would fall. The king was still livid and called Elijah troubler of Israel. But Elijah was not intimidated and basically told the king, I'm not the troublemaker. You are. The stage was set for the clash on Mount Carmel between 850 prophets of Baal and one prophet of God. Elijah challenged the watching crowd. How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Paraphrasing here was Elijah's dare. Let's have a contest. Let the God who is God answer with fire out of heaven. That was a fair enough test. Baal, the storm god, should be able to send a little lightning down. Elijah offered them every advantage, then mocked their ineffective work. The time that Baal's prophets spent pleading, shouting, and cutting themselves got no response from Baal. Then Elijah prepared the sacrifice before inviting God to give the people a glimpse of glory. Fire fell and consumed the sacrifice, the water, and the altar. The people fell in their faces hollering, The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! They couldn't help but admit that God was alive. However, the Lord wasn't finished. He turned the rain spigot back on. Elijah prayed intensely seven times before rain poured. A soaked Elijah went running off that mountain, and he proved that God is alive. 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 1 to 4 Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets of Baal with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, 
so may the gods do to me, and even more. If by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like the life of one of them. And Elijah was afraid, and arose and ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself traveled a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came and sat down under a juniper tree, and asked God that he might die. He said, It is enough now. O oh Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Elijah, fearing for his life, made his way to Horeb. As a result of the prophet's emotional and spiritual exhaustion, God instructed an angel to prepare him supper, and then reassured him of his continued presence and provision for Israel's future when the meal was finished. For Elijah to continue the mission, God had already appointed a companion for him to work alongside. Elijah passed on the responsibility of prophecy to Elisha, a man who worked with his hands. He approached Elijah in hopes of receiving a double portion of his spirit. Elisha was making a request to have the authority to succeed him as both his heir and his successor, so that he could, in a sense, take over the business. Number 8. Her death happened according to prophecy. A few years later, Ahab was slain in a battle against the Syrians, and Jezebel continued to rule for nearly another ten years after his death. As Elijah's successor and a prophet in his own right, Elisha resumed Elijah's crusade to wipe out worship of Baal. He installed a militant commander named Jehu to be king of Israel, an order that prompted civil war, as Jehoram, Ahab, and Jezebel's son then ruled. Jehu was a commander of chariots for the king of Israel, Ahab, and his son Jehoram, on Israel's frontier facing Damascus and Assyria. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head, and looked out at a window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace? Who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her under foot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go. See now this cursed woman, and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, And he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 30 to 36. In the annals of history, Jezebel is remembered as the personification of all that is cunning, sneaky, nasty, vindictive, and vicious. As Jehu rode into the gates of Jezreel, she looked out of the palace's window and said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? He raised his head and signaled her chamberlains, who hurled her out the window. She was quickly consumed by the street dogs according to the word of Elijah the Tishbite, after the incident of Naboth and his property. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, in the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 19. Her name afterward came to be used as a synonym for a wicked woman. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By your teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 20.